The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Paulton, I'm a network admin for a library uh, club, basically, a buying club. And I, I do software as a service for them. I, I inherited this little problem, which led to what we're talking about here. Um, used to teach class, so I'm not comfortable if I don't have a blackboard. So the uh, so I can get it to behave itself. So here's the problem. I inherited a customer's two systems on somebody else's network. I was given a pseudo, wow, I was given pseudo for the two boxes, but I wasn't given a root password because they belong to somebody else yet again. Oh, great, okay, that's reasonable. You all use Ubuntu, you could do that with sudo, right? Don't even need to know the root password. The problem is that this, these two boxes had a bunch of custom software on it. And the one piece of software they had on it was, is called uh, DSpace, which is a, which is a um, digital repository. And so if you go to Internet Archives, Y'all been to Internet Archives, the Wayback Machine? They also do digital repositories for libraries and cities and who knows what. So the, the pictures of your great-grandparents in that little city in Maryland or wherever, they may have a picture of them, mislabeled. So you'll, you won't find it, but it's there. They'll be labeled after the newspapers or whatever they're connected to. So this is a great idea for all this old stuff that you would never get if you never uh, actually went to that little library in the town where you grew up or where your grandparents grew up. So I get these boxes, and all this sounded great. You know, it was custom, custom software that I do not have documentation for. Anyone else had that experience? Fun, isn't it? I wonder what this does. Don't press that button, right? <laughs> and the software didn't always work. The software on, on, the, on the second system, which was mostly customized, didn't work. So it's, we had another guy trying to figure out what, what it was doing. And we discovered that the customer thought that they had been getting backups for the last X number of years from the previous support people, which turned out to be, guess what? You're good. You're good. It was exactly right. It was terrible. The, uh, there was no backup. There was no evidence of backup. And the systems were Fedora 7, which were, when I got them, two years out of date. Past end of life. Could not update. Could not add anything. Now, that left me with a little bit of a problem uh, to to work with it, because I want to do backups. You know, you've seen some backup programs, right? You've seen Bacula and Amanda. Anyone else seen others? What do you have to do with those? You have to install them. They have dependencies that are main, may or may not be on those machines. So I couldn't use what they had. So all I had to do was create a recoverable condition, because they were concerned that what if one of the systems actually dies, because they are old and they could just die. And these old systems, I couldn't do much with them, uh, except that I could discover that they were full of unpurged logs, which meant the hard drives were full, almost entirely full. When I got it, it was like a ticking time bomb or, you know, you got two flat tires and you're headed for a curve. One drive was 40, one 120. Full of 
100K log files. You know how long it takes to fill up a 128 gig drive with 100K log files? So I had to use only the software that was on the boxes. I had to find a way to guess what were the right files to back up. You may not have thought about this, but doing a backup of the whole system is very wasteful. And yeah, you can. You can do that. But you don't need it all, and you may not need even half of it. So I had to figure out what software was in use and where the software put stuff. Uh, this, is, this is a challenge, because for most people, um, me included, I don't really want to know where all those pieces are. You know, If you have uh, a standard Linux system set up in a standard way, most of the software is going to follow the POSIX file convention. And that turns out to be your friend, because then you start looking for, OK, where are the actual program files for these programs, once you find out what they are. And if, you, if they're set up in a sort of a POSIX way, they'll be where you expect them to be. And that was, in fact, helpful. So I did, did manage to audit them and found out that this is basically what was on them. Versions of all this stuff that, this is that post, PostgreSQL 8.2, which uh, in this case was it put in a different place than the new ones are. New, one, new ones end up in slash var slash lib slash PostgreSQL. The, this old one was in, in something called PSQL. And so I couldn't find it in, by looking for the standard folder. There's peculiarities. I don't know a lot about Java and Ant, except that I installed the newer versions of, of DSpace, and, and it was a bear to install. So I didn't want to imagine how interesting it would be to install or to recover that, that old version. So what do you have on a system? What do you have on every system? You've got TAR. You've got uh, SSH server. How do you know? Well, then you just shell into it. If you just shelled into it, it has SSH, SSH server. And most of them have client. Your desktop has client. Most servers, like hardware servers, have SSH server. So thank goodness for that. So when you're, if you're working with, see, because on, on my ser server two, I was running PostgreSQL, I could use PG dump all. PG dump all just takes everything, all of the details, all of the users, the schemas, the tables, all the databases, and gives you a recoverable package. So I was, I'm running those backups, running that backup, essentially once a day once I found I had it. And with tar, you can say, well, what do I need to back up? I need to back up that PGSQL for folder, you know, the Postgres folder. I need to back up all of those programs, all of those program folders, because they may have customized information in there. Where else do they have customized information? Anyone know? Sometimes in root, yes, exactly. Sometimes in the Etsy folder, and sometimes in the home folders, depending on how the developers and administrators dealt with it. So in a general, I was trying to build a general algorithm for how, what I'm going to back up. So it ended up being essentially home folders, root, Etsy, OPT because some programs are in OPT, things that are installed not by the system repos. If you're installing as if you're a system repo into slash USR slash bin, you may have problems with that. I'm not saying you will, guaranteed, but if you do updates, it's in a place where it might get overwritten by something else. And if, you're have, if you have, a, for instance, this uh, DSpace, you're not very likely to get that overwritten by something else, one would hope. But it was still out of harm's way. <clears throat> so 
so since I had two machines, and only two machines, I did not have backup storage for the system. <coughs> so you get the, uh, I have to save from one machine to the other machine. And it worked out that if, I, if this week I delete the old remote tarball, push across an, the, new, the new remote tarball, run that system, and uh, then make this week's one. We end up with three weeks' worth, one on the old one, last week's on the, on the local machine, and this week's on the local machine, which worked OK, as long as I absolutely purged the oldest one from that 40 gig hard drive, because I didn't have space to have two. So then the question, it's a question your manager would ask you too. Is it recoverable? When you take an Tara file, it compresses that file, but it doesn't change anything. And so if you compress slash var slash p pgsql, what you get in that tar file is the whole file structure, but nothing else. You don't get all the other things under slash var slash uh, uh, lib, right? You'll just get that piece. So if you're saving slash var slash, slash libs slash pgsql and slash uh, var slash www, because these are web apps, and it's very likely you're going to have some web stuff going on, too. So Oh, good. Wow. Um, so the first thing is do, a, do this backup and make sure that you can then recover the, all the files. I have no development machine to test this on. Okay, I can't test it on a development machine, but I can look at the raw data and make sure that it looks the same, like visual inspection. That's interesting. It was a heavy downpour. <clears throat> and you can also diff the files, okay? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, on the command line, you run the command diff and then two different files here, or even folders or directories, and they'll tell you what's different. This is a, like, well, a surprisingly helpful tool. Um, so we ended up with the idea that uh, a weekly data dump, or a, a weekly configuration file dump, sorry, uh, and the data files themselves, with, with uh, digital preservation, there's a lot of things that are just basically files, uh, JPEGs and stuff, that doesn't change just because someone looked at it. It's just a file. So we didn't think that that needed to be updated every day, but we did update the database dump every day. And so I had seven copies of the database dump sitting there inside the database folder. And when it was time to do the main backup, push them to the backup folder. OK. And uh, got that to work. This didn't take too long, but I had to test it on other machines, because all of the stuff on these machines was essentially irreplaceable. And so I didn't even want to run tar on it until I was sure I wasn't going to get any changes. OK, so at this point, OCD, of course, raises its ugly head. Maybe not that head, but it's some other ugly head. Um, how, many backups do <coughs> how many backups do you run? How many backups do you keep? Because once I had it that it was all working, I could have pushed off board and, and save backups other places. I tested this out, it did work. But how many, how deep are you going to go into that hole? I ended up only one more level. It's a, a, lo a lot of it comes down to how important your management thinks it is to hold the stuff. And 
uh, this may not be true as in a technical sense, because if you've got a good copy of it already, you don't need another copy of that copy. But sometimes they just want that anyway. So these are my, all my questions that we pretty much got answered. About halfway through the second month, discovered that one of the directories we needed to be backing up, we weren't. So that had to be added to the backup concept. And for every, every backup before that, it hadn't been there. The only good thing that we can say about backup is you don't need it every day. And it's not, you're not going to have a uh, disaster every day, right? This is the only way most people's home computers are to have anything on them of any value at all. Because we don't need them every day. But all of this ended up becoming the, the project that I've put together that the link on the front page was. Because you know, what, what if they wanted to update to a more current version of Fedora? There's a lot of different things that would have to be adjusted, and I wasn't sure how that was going to work. But we ended up with what has worked out. I've got this working now on a production network with, uh, it's on 26 machines right now, and it's working properly. You know, good Lord willing, and the crick don't rise, it's working properly today. Um, and you can read a tarred file anywhere you have a command line. You can read a tarred file on a Windows system. If you, ha if you have the 7Z uh, or something else that will open a, a tar.gz file, you can do that with any system. This, is, this made the librarians happy. Because if, if, if you're in the world of, of data preservation, the idea of having a, a, a format that you can no longer read after X amount of time It'd be like opening a book and not being able to read the language in it anymore. That does happen, but it happens over the course of several hundred years. Digital formats tend to be uh, uh, outdated over the course of six or seven years, ten years. But TAR has had r remarkable longevity. So. Um, so there's no questions. So everybody is asleep, right? Anyone not asleep, please raise their hand. Okay, good. There's three or four. Um, but once I, did, once I did this and said, well, I ought to open this up to the world, because it would be useful to people who have similar situations. If you come up on a machine that's very, very old, that you don't have much space on, that you don't have a, any wiggle room on software, this would be useful. So I, I started thinking, well, how are we going to make it useful to the world? And the first thing was, my, for my original design was designed around that one set of systems. The design on those systems was a single partition. If you installed a Debian system using their assistance, you know, their, their guided installation, they would set up a uh, four or five different partitions and your root partition on the hard drive would be 385 meg. So if you're putting your backup files into the root partition that would be a problem, right? Unless you've got nothing going on, if it's an empty machine, yeah, maybe it'll work. But all you have to do is throw a couple of, a couple of fi files in anywhere and then it's not going to work. So that in the system needs to be made more, more POSIX compliant. And what does that mean? I need to put my, I need to put those files into slash var slash something, right? So that they're in a place you'd expect to find them. None of this matters to beginners, but once you've got into it a little bit, you start to realize that if you're looking for something, it's not where you expect it. You're, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. You're, at least you're going to feel like you're in a lot of trouble. You can't really package a program that's not at least somewhat POSIX compliant. So if I wanted to give it to you in your Ubuntu system, can't do it. You know, it's just not possible. So uh, that's got to be done. I want to automate installation if possible, because this is the sort of thing that with a new system, you can automate. 
in an old system, you can't. So you'd have to have sort of a, a case structure of the program to make sure that, okay, if this system's so old it doesn't have repositories anymore, it will not continue to attempt to install something that doesn't exist. Fair enough, right? But if it's brand new and it doesn't have rsync, like brand new Debian squeeze, yes, sir? Mm-hmm. Oh, hugely. And so, unless they are keeping up with firewalls and, and all other vulnerabilities from the outside, it's just waiting to get compromised. So why not just, you know, tell them, you know, get upgrade, you know, convince them that the way to do it correctly is to upgrade it to a um, distro like Rail, which has a 10-year cycle. Right. Right. Or, or send OS. Yeah which has a 10-year cycle, has the same cycle. It's an excellent plan. This is, in fact, what I did attempt. And they were so scared that their custom software would break that there was no way, there was no going there. And there's a lot of old systems with custom software. There's, since the, you, can't, you can't always figure out what they did in the first place, you're going to be stuck with that. Every, all these old place, old things. Now, the one thing I would, I like to try to do with old systems is get people onto newer, less customized software solutions as well. And it's a lot easier if it's not customized because then you can just do upgrades. But by the time I got it, it was already past upgrading because uh, Fedora 8 was also end of life. And <laughs> so there's really nothing I could do about that side of it except a total rebuild. And you're right, that would have been great. So where am I at? The, uh, this ne the next line about purging stale tarballs on FreeNAS, because on a production system, I was using a storage solution, uh, network attached storage with FreeNAS system, and using uh, ZFS. Now, you all been, you heard about ZFS? How cool it is, how cool it can be? Guess what? If you fill up a drive in ZFS, you can't delete anything. I discovered that by filling up the drive in ZFS. Yeah, it's a production system. Luckily, it was not a frontline system. <laughs> but, uh, so you want to have it purge, and, and I, I have got that essentially done now. That's the automatic purging is, is a, a find files of this type older than and remove them. I can show you the line if you're interested. And it's, it's useful and it's safe because it's not going to delete stuff that's too new. You don't want to have your regex be so free that it'll delete everything. So, one thing about the, this system is that when tar runs, it kicks out messages, ongoing messages that aren't very useful. Removing trailing slashes, for instance. Yes, and who cares, right? I don't know why it does that. I'm sure there's people who could tell you why it does that. I would just assume that it put that into dev null because it's useless information. Um, and then automating the res restoration functionality. The problem I have right now is that to restore, you have to untar and rsync back in or shell it back in, secure, secure FTP. And that takes a lot of time. You have to make sure your, your system's turned off, your database is turned off, and then you can, you can rsync in all the pieces you need and then restart it and it'll work, but that's, it would be neat if you could just say, I want the backup from two weeks ago, bang, and have it do all that on its own. Anyone know any reason why that couldn't be done? So, it's, a, it's really rather a short program because I don't have it's, it's, a, it's so much in, pr in progress 
So I thought I would just go ahead and show you the scripts. Who here does shell scripting? Who here is terrified of shell scripting? Okay, good. Yeah, it's, it's a little scary because there's so many different things that can be done wrong. But this is a very simple shell script. The, uh, that's, a, that's a redirect to a file name, right? And, and the, this right here is, is a way to take the host name and instead of just saying host name, it runs the program and brings you the host name. Yes? And so that one will say host name PG dump all, and that makes a data dump every day. And because this is uh, anonymous, it's just that. I, don't, I didn't want to have these files have huge long names. They still ended up pretty long. Then this is tarred, compressed to a name, host name, PG dump, and date. And all this structure here gives you a pretty nice date, readable date. Um, And then you use the find command. If you all used locate before, do you know what I'm talking about? That's a cool command. Find is about 800 times stronger. You all use find? You ought to check find out, those, for you, those of you who haven't used it. Because it is, it is a huge thing. Because you can, you can search through recursive directories with find and find just what you're looking for. You put in locate and, and a short term in there, and you'll find everything in the entire hard drive that has those, those characters, and it's not very useful. But this is the en entire PostgreSQL dump script. And when I was doing it on, originally on the boxes, I, I just wrote out the scripts. But since using these fancy naming techniques, it was hard to remember so I made a script for it. And what the next one does is essentially you set up your, your two backup directories, as I told you, in the wrong place. You know that's going to just end up in the root directory, a slash whatever. And uh, I can't use that on about half my systems. I have to adjust it and move it to someplace else, but uh, for the old system it worked. Because these two directory names then become, if those directories don't exist, then you make them. You create them and uh, make, make them absolutely free for use. Is that a security problem? Yes, yeah, slightly. Now, any user on that, anyone who could log into that server could look at those backups, could delete those backups. But you know who can log into those servers? Just me. Um, these, uh, e even these web servers, you can't log into them. You can't shell into them unless you have an account on them. So this, this then is to, it builds using a variable for host name. Uh, and and then get, getting getting rid of everything inside directory two. Directory two is where all the small uh, the original tar files go. But we want to get all of them out of there so that we can move on to the next step. Because you don't want to have two versions of the same thing, even if they have different dates on them then you, it just is going to make your backup grow bigger and bigger and bigger until your backup basically is taking up the whole hard drive. And then we get into those series of, if it's there, we want to we want to run a dump on it. Like MySQL it wasn't on every machine, and it isn't on every machine, but if it's on your machine, it'd be nice if it would do that automatically and you didn't have to search it out and run another script for it. And that makes a dump of it and uh, drops it into this 
into this tar.gz file. The, uh, find out where I am. If you've got a PostgreSQL folder, then you want to back that up. But in this case, because we're using a different dump system, it's just going to grab the files out of that PostgreSQL folder, drag them into the backup fo file, and tar them. And uh, now it just gets in, into some of this stuff is you're not going to see this on every machine. Open, open ILS is, is a, for a evergreen cataloging system. And I know, you know, who here has that on their system? <laughs> so there's no point in having it checked for every time and do something with something that won't be there. And the same with the, the PostgreSQL stuff. www files. Since the only thing that I've found in, in slash VAR that started with a W was the www web files, that was enough. It's, if it has web files in it, we're going to make a directory, a web directory, to back them up. And then there's stuff that you're not going to ask if, because you know there's home folders. You're not missing any of that. So you'll always see a home folder. And so we're going to just back those up right away. We're going to tar those up. And you're always going to have root, so you're going to tar that up. That's more POSIX stuff. And then in the end, all of those little tar files in one big file and dropped into folder one, which is the parent of folder two. And once you've done that, now you may have two or three or five or who knows how many, depending on what your uh, purging system is, but if you have another of these huge tar files, you want to get rid of it, so get rid of anything older than four days, which gets, takes care of the seven-day-old stuff. And uh, the transfer is really simple. In this case, I just put example.org, the rsync av uh, from directory one of anything that says tar.gz, send that to its folder. This was done on my utility box. And since I don't have internet here, or I'd show you the utility box, I can get at it from the internet. Um, then uh, put it into its, uh, its uh, free NAS array. And at that point, any questions? Have I, I, I say everyone still asleep now? I do, but not nearly as often. Uh, the, qu uh, the question was, in, ad in addition to backups of this nature, do, do I have an image of the whole disk in case I got a backup from bare metal? And the answer is I do in this case. I can't always guarantee I have that, but in, in this case, my, my network's run on a, on a VMware uh, EXSI system, so I can run very simple backups using that. And it's a pretty good way to handle backups, but it's not perfect. Yes, sir? The process we have for imaging that, would you do um, basically make the tar balls and back up the physical files first before you did any, um, any event that while you're doing this whole image? Were you, were you afraid of hardware barriers in terms of the browser and web? Um, on the first original two, did I, did I worry about the backups before I did the images? That's the question. And yeah, I couldn't image those. And the, the person who, who owned the network they were on, he wouldn't give me any help at all. And I'm sure he was busy, and there's lots of good reasons for all of that, but I couldn't image them at all. I was much more concerned that uh, the systems were, you know, the tar was going to fail 
I've never seen tar fail before, but I guess it could be done. Yes, sir? That's a nice way to put it. It's <laughs> you got all kinds of time. Once a week, you're going to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So if you R-sync into, into that R-sync backup, and you could also do a cron job for that. Yeah, it runs on a cron job every two hours. Yeah. So at most, if, if I lose the main server, you know, blows up the second file, at most I've lost two hours of the week, which is exactly what's going on. Yeah, that's a that's a good system. That's a good way to handle it, with all all those data files. Question. It's kind of a funny thing. I, I have uh, a number of friends who do admin who are are syncing rather than using any kind of fancy backup systems. You know, it's simple. Right, that's true. Yeah, okay. Any other things? Okay. Well, we're way ahead of schedule. But that's the, that's the the thing when you got a when you got a good class everything moves too fast. <laughs> All right, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. All right, thank you very much for talking today. You want to give him a round of applause? And before you run out, don't forget there's a survey today. If you pick it up from the registration desk, fill it in, put it in the box, they will draw the surveys after the uh, keynote speech tonight um, for the raffle, and you can win prizes if you fill in a survey today. There is another survey tomorrow, different survey with a different raffle. So go fill in a survey, please. So if you want the, the, uh, to pull the, the uh, software, if, if you want to pull the software uh, to look at it yourself, and then that's where to go. Uh, GitHub.com slash wolf29 slash get back. And uh, if you want to send me an email, that's my email, wolf.halton at lyricist.org. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications. 
from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing like that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. 
High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloudstack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.